name is Stefan Hermann. I'm a software engineer at the Commonwealth Bank. And I'm here today to talk to you about um, Cluster as Code, or how we go from uh, how we provision our uh, resource cluster. Uh, to give you some background, um, Commonwealth Bank is one of Australia's largest financial institutions, and I work in the analytics information area. So several years ago, we started entering the big data space, um, and we started doing our own heavy cluster to do uh, data analytics and derive value from that. So that was quite successful, so we started adding more and more um, racks of servers to store and process all the data that we're dealing with. Um, so the problem we started running into that is that we we're still kind of stuck in the era of um, cats, not cattle. So the way we manage that hardware, particularly the way we start managing large volumes of servers, um, didn't keep up. The other problem we also encountered is that well, we've had um, servers in particular like Duke, which is great at doing batch processing and analytics. And our developers also needed um, the ability to be able to stand up microservices and to be able to do more flexible things so they can come up with different ways to utilize and experiment um, with the data. So we've had all these servers, but we couldn't really necessarily use them effectively. And we didn't get the utilization that we wanted out of them. So at the late last year, early this year, um, we started. Um, created a team to look at uh, standing up a Mesos cluster. So moving all our, uh, moving our physical, uh, moving our uh, Hadoop uh, servers onto Mesos. Uh, as I mentioned, we're working with a physical hardware, we can't work, uh, we can't put our data in the cloud. So what is it that we wanted? Uh, physical hardware, we want to be safe and secure, uh, we're a bank, so we need our and we need to protect our customers' data, and we also need to be available for them to be able to use the data. As I said, we want to be cheap. Uh, we had the problem where cost was going up linearly, and as we grow, you need to be able to scale up very quickly. And you want to be agile. So we want to be able to quickly adopt your changes uh, and be responsive. So, what does that then mean that we concretely want? We want to be able to build and manage servers and clusters deterministically. Uh, as we mentioned a couple of times, doing this with distributed systems is hard. And so, we want to be able to, as much as possible, know that if we make our change from infrastructure, that that change is applied or it has failed. And we want to actually ideally be in a situation where if we make a change, it works on all servers, not just some of them. And so, that kind of leads us to immutable infrastructure. So we want to do immutable infrastructure. Um, and the next one is probably something quite common. We want all our um, configuration to be in source control. I think this day and age is quite standard. We want to have the ability to know why we made changes, what the history of something is, and we want to be able to track it and even use um, things like GitHub with pull requests to do our approvals. So move the approval flow as close to the change as possible. We want the ability to test our changes. So we want to be confident that if we make a change, that it actually works when we roll it out. And it also reduces our development cycle. So rather than knowing that something is broken after we roll it out, we, can, uh, we want to detect it as early as possible. Uh, we want to have an abstraction to reason about clusters. So if you make a change to a physical machine, and that physical machine is part of a larger distributed system, that has an impact on that system. So if you have a Sukiba cluster, for example, and you move one of the Sukiba nodes, that could break the core. Uh, or uh, all the other, um, if you change from, uh, if you want to change masters in that Zookeeper cluster and actually if your one machine is broken, you replace it, that could have an impact on all the um, eight other agents that you're talking to that Zookeeper version. So we want to be able to reason at the cluster level. We want to have extractions that help us deal with that and encapsulate that, not just think about it at the individual machine level. And we want to containerize all our workload. So we're standing up a system um, to deal with containers, and we don't want to run separate infrastructure to manage that system. So as much as possible, we want to containerize everything so it can run all on the same infrastructure. So what is then that we plan on doing? So this is kind of a high-level approach. Um, we want to create role-specific images and bake as much of the configuration into that image as possible. So 
So what versions of packages we're installing, um, even things like tuning should be baked into that image. Uh, and then we're going to deploy that image to each machine. So we're going to deploy different images to different machines based on the role they have. And where we have to specify machine specific configuration, such as IP addresses or what cluster they should join, we use a cloud config um, from like, the cloud config uh, library framework to provide that um, information. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. It's the same thing that Amazon uses to provide um, information to machines as well. And if we need to make a change, when we go back to um, our configuration and source control, we make the change, we test it, and we redeploy it. So that's the high level approach that we're taking. At so that point, you might ask yourself, there's already a whole bunch of configuration tools. Uh, there's Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Sort. They used to be the hotness several years ago, um, and there's a stack of them. So why not just use one of those? And the reason I guess we don't, or we want to avoid using one of those is because it's non-deterministic. So with those tools, you tend to make a change to all your machines in parallel. And if you have enough machines, that change will fail. It will fail at some stage somewhere. And now your machine is slightly different. Also, if you make that change over a long enough period of time, like doing a package install, uh, there's a possibility that you install packet version X today, and it's an updated version tomorrow, and now your machines have slightly different packages. The other problem is you might have started with some base image, and over years you've rolled out um, continuous changes. And now if you have a cluster with your machines and so forth, now you roll a new rack of hardware. How do you bring that new rack up to speed? Do you use a, new, a different base image? Um, do you use the original base image and roll out the same changes? What if you install a different package during that time? So you end up with this cluster that's slightly different. Um, you might have had ops people lock into your machines and make changes, do version fixes, things like that, and it never got quite cleaned up. So you have a cluster where all your machines are potentially slightly different, and it becomes much harder to reason about what does your cluster actually look like. If there's a failure, why did that failure occur? Why is that machine affected? Why is machine A different to machine B? Is that intentional, or is it, um, did it just turn out that way? So we wanted to avoid all that, and by doing, uh, I guess, uh, banking everything to the image, you can avoid that. That's why I didn't choose those things. So just to give you a quick update of the kind of stack we're looking at, uh, it's running Ubuntu, uh, physical hardware, Mesos, Marathon for microservices, and we use Calico for networking. Uh, so Calico allows us to give each of our um, workloads its own IP. Um, and it does that without using any sort of tunneling or um, a VXLAN, anything like that. It actually uses just um, layer 3 routing, so it turns each of the physical servers into a, a router and then uses BGP to propagate the routes. So that makes it easy from our perspective because we don't have to learn different technologies. It's the same technology that makes up standard boring data centers. Um, it's easy to understand, it's easier to debug, and it just reduces the complexity. Um, complexity. So it's also quite handy for us to actually pass that. So, uh, I think it's a really nice solution for the space. And we use Stock as a containerizer. Uh, we use Mist DNS for the dynamic DNS, Power DNS for the static DNS. And then we use the Elastic Stack for logging, um, Sysdb for monitoring. We use HashiCorp Board for uh, secrets management. And we use OpenStack a running to actually deploy uh, uh, our physical machines. Can I just ask at this point who's running a physical data center? as opposed to using the cloud. Can you just put your hand up if you're doing physical hardware? Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you guess how we did it. I'm going to do that in two parts. The first part is how do we build that OS image that we're going to deploy and how do we test it? And the second part is given that we have that OS image, how do we deploy and orchestrate clusters? So building the OS image. So you got two high-level images. One is the master image, which runs all the master functionality for us. So it's got the Zookeeper Quorum, it's got the Mesos master, it's got Marathon master, it's got etcd um, cluster, which is needed for Calico, and it's running our board, HA, it's running Mesos DNS, PowerDNS, and, and then it has uh, Elastic and Assistic Agent um, for its monitoring. The agent is much simpler. It runs the Mesos agent, and uh, runs Calico for the agent networking, um, Docker, and again our monitoring tools. So at that point you also might ask yourself, 
if you keep reprovisioning machines, how do you do respectful um, uh, workload? I mean, if you're running big data uh, software on this, you don't want to slow the data away every single time. I mean, we could, but it would be really good to have to be if every single time you had to recreate that data. So what we do is we actually only reprovision the OS images. So we have some workload running on it that needs to get data. Um, and we assign disks to that workload where it can persist its data. And during reprovision cycles, that doesn't get touched unless we decide to re um, unless we decide to repurpose the node. So this is a high-level overview of our workflow. Um, so we have our OS images in source control, and we actually use Docker as a configuration language abstraction to define and express our OS image. And I'll show you what I mean by that in um, a second. So our OS images are defined as Docker. So the first step we do is a Docker build. That gives us a very quick, easy way to verify that the instructions that we have make sense. Think of it kind of as a quasi-compilation step. And then we can do some very simple testing. Uh, very simple testing to verify that the build went correctly. So we can test things like were the right packages installed, did the configuration scripts run and produce the correct output, etc. So now our Docker image is not bootable, so we use an OpenStack tool called Disk Image Builder to convert our to our Docker image into something that can be booted. And once we've done that. Uh, we use, uh, we can do more um, advanced testing. We do our cluster replication testing, like our system integration testing to verify that the image that we created spin up and produce the kind of cluster we want to produce. Once all that passes, we can publish the image to our artifact as well. So, this is how we define a resource agent. And you can see it just looks like any standard Docker um, repo you might be used to. We have a Docker file, and then we have a bunch of files that we copy across it. So it's Probably a lot more happening here than you would see in a, any other um, Docker repository um, because we actually define your OS image, not just a simple single purpose microservice. Um, so, uh, so, this is our Docker bar for the agent. Um, so, we've got, uh, we inherit from some base image, we do some setup steps um, so we can do package installs. So, we add some repo uh, app repositories, some keys, things like that. We install packages, in particular we install Mesos, we pin to a version, we install Docker, we get some other binaries that we need, things like that. And then we enable our systemd services. Yeah. Um, so that actually gives us everything to define an operating system image. And it's actually, for us, a really nice way to express an operating system. It's a, um, Docker gives us a really simple and easy to understand language. Um, any software developer who's been on software developers who have been working with microservices so they find it easy to understand this, easy to come on board, easy to make changes, easy to participate. Um, it's, and I find it easy to also understand the reason why compared to some other languages that you might use to define um, operating systems. So this is the configuration of the operating system. There's not much more to it. Um, so then we build it. Um, and once we build it as a Docker image, we need to convert it to something you can actually use to boot up this permission list. This is an excerpt of a much larger script. Um, and what we use is a tool called, uh, from OpenStack called Disk Image Builder, and that converts it to a QCAR2 format, which you now um, boot a machine with. So we'll do things like add the partitions, add a boot loader, stuff like that. So now I'm going to show you um, a screenshot, uh, like a video of a build. And so this is from uh, the press Playmax. So this will build the image part. It's um, heavily edited and fast forwarded because this takes about 20 minutes. But so the first thing is, here it's building the master um, Docker, uh, doing the running Docker step. Then we're running some uh, verification afterwards. Um, so this just verifies that it works. And then we're also doing the um, physical build and actually running our cluster integration tests. So with the three images that we're building, the base, the master, and the agent, right now this takes about 20 minutes. So this is just where here it's running the actual cluster verification test. And I'll show you what kind of tests we run in a second. So it spins up actual instances of our agent and master um, nodes and makes sure that the image produces the right outcome. So this is this. Uh, 
this is the kind of test we run after the Docker build step. In, it tests that the packages that we need were installed and have the right versions, things like that. And so that's the first level rough and dirty high level check so that you can get a quick turnaround if there's anything wrong. Now the next step of testing is we produce that image and we use a custom tool called Simeon. Um, Simeon uses Docker Compose and KVM to spin up a, I guess, virtual representation of the Siri cluster. So it uses KVM um, to spin up uh, three instances of our master image and it also just, um, spins up some supporting services and it uses VDE to do its networking. So that kind of allows us to simulate a physical deployment. And then we test things like if we spin up our three master images and given that we've given them the right configuration, we should have a Zookeeper cluster and we should be able to write to the Zookeeper um, a cluster and read from it and it should work. So if you write something to it, we should get the same thing back. And our cluster should only have exactly one leader. So our master image should just give some configuration, just spin up and set up a Zookeeper cluster without any manual interference. And this just tested. So that's how we build our um, OS images. So the things that work well for us are the ability to test, in particular the ability to simulate this class of deployments, and uh, just what events we need to do deployments, and it also helps us to um, yeah, increase our development flow. Uh, using Docker file as our abstraction for defining the OS image, just again, it's easy to understand, it's easy for anyone to participate, so I think it's actually quite a nice way to define OS image. The fact that we don't have any mutation, I um, already mentioned this before, but just makes it easy to reason about the state of our cluster. It gives us that deterministic property. And it actually gives us confidence to know that if you want to know what's in our cluster and what our machines look like, just go to source control and we see the definition. Um, and using pull requests for changes just makes it easier to approve changes. Um, so I guess it's important for us because we have to go through a change approval process, that having that as close to the source code as possible. Just uh, makes the process a whole lot better. So pain points. Um, as I mentioned, everything we do, we do inside Docker. So we're using Docker to build, to convert Docker images to OS images, and that exercises the kernel quite heavily, um, and it causes us to run across a lot of edge cases that you would not normally run into when you do Docker. So we've always, we've always encountered a lot of problems trying to make this work and trying to make it fixed, uh, trying to get that fixed. One of the problems we encountered is that in order to create um, an OS image, you, you tend to use a loopback device. Um, and so when you use a loopback device from Docker, it works the first time uh, perfectly, but it doesn't clean it up quite correctly. But it doesn't leave it behind dirty enough for the kernel of the OS to detect, just enough that it doesn't work. So when you run it the next time, um, you, uh, uh, you ask the kernel for another loopback device, and it will give you the same loopback device because it thinks it's fine, it's unused, you have to go use it, and you try and use it and it just fails. And now the kernel knows it's dirty. So when you run it again, you ask the loopback device, it goes, I can't do the first one because it's dirty, I'll give you another one. And so we end up in a situation where about half our builds would fail, uh, just because of that issue. So the way we worked around with that is we actually use, um, I'm not sure if you guys know Run B, but Run B can, um, so Docker can run, uh, Docker Demon can use Run B as a backend. And what it will do that way is um, we use KVM to spin up um, uh, yeah, a virtual OS, a virtual kernel, um, and keep that to the Docker image inside. So now we've got the isolation we need. Every time we um, do our builds, we're actually running inside a VM. We're still using all the Docker abstractions, everything looks like Docker, but now running inside of the end, so that back um, issue went away. The other benefit we're able to get out of that is that we're just doing builds. We don't need to persist anything. We don't need to use the parts for this. It would just be so much better if everything was done in memory. So we actually disabled and um, we're able to um, configure to use a kernel where F-Sync is disabled, and so we just got a whole bunch of um, speed up by not syncing to disk. Uh, the other pain point, even with that speed up, the build cycle is still relatively slow. I think that's just standard for building OS images. Uh, even if you use some other 2D still run into that. 
first of all, it's both. Um, so as I mentioned, it takes about 20 minutes to build our three images and run through all the tests. So it's both building and test. That's 10 minutes. So now, given that we have an OS image, I'll talk to you about how we deploy and orchestrate clusters and how we actually use it. So to give you another high-level overview, we've got two main repos, and we've got an infrastructure repo and a cluster definition. In our infrastructure repo, we just keep um, physical static information about our servers. Uh, so things like what are the MAC addresses, where are they located, how are they patched up, how are they cable. Things that don't really change, but that you want to report when you first install them. And then we've got our cluster definition, where in a declarative way we declare where our cluster should be. So we say, our cluster, I want to have a cluster that looks like X. It has five masters, 20 agents, and here's some configuration for it. Now what happens if we make, when we make a change, it's declarative. So we declare, I now want a cluster that looks like Y. So I had cluster X, but I want an X to now look like this. I want three masters instead of five. And what now happens is we'll trigger um, a CI CD process and I'll figure out whether I want to get from X to Y, these are all the changes I need to make. And I'll simulate those changes. And if you raise the PR, it will update that PR of the change it's going to make. So it'll let you know that if you want me to go from X to Y, these are all the steps I'm going to take. Are you happy with that? And if you merge and approve your PR, we will then go and execute those changes. And in order to execute those changes, it needs to talk to a bunch of um, other systems. So again, we're doing distributed. Um, we're doing with distributed systems here. So if we make a change to a machine, we probably have to update a bunch of masters and let them know what's happening. Right now, the two systems we've got integrated are OpenStack Ironic, which we use to do our physical deployment of hardware, and Board, which we use to manage the secrets. And in the future, we need to integrate a whole bunch more. So we need to integrate DNS, Suki, the etcd, and so on. There's a whole bunch. But so we go in um, our tool, Mission Planner. We go and talk to those services and orchestrate them. So what it does with board is, if you're standing up a new cluster, it creates a namespace for that cluster, and it creates some policies. So it'll have a policy for the master nodes, and it'll have a policy for any node in the cluster. And it'll enroll all the physical machines inside board so they can access those um, namespaces and get the secrets they need to get out of them. So that we can do authentication between agents and masters, um, and things like that. So that's the high level overview. So this is the physical cluster definition. Um, so you can see here it's a defined rack. And we've got some information on the size and location. And we've got some information on the server inside it, some serial when it was installed, and MAC addresses and things like that. And then we've also from that we can derive things like a picture of what the rack actually looks like. So you can see how it's stacked up. And so you can use that to derive a whole bunch of extra information as we need. Um, in the future, we need to integrate that with our cluster definition, but we haven't gotten to that stage yet. So this is our cluster definition. So here it's a YAML file, and we define we want some the clusters, we want a green cluster, some basic configuration about it, so all the nodes should have these DNS settings. And then we've got the master nodes, so we've got master nodes called Able here, um, some node specific information. Some information, so we tell it what IP address it should have and to which interface it should find it, what VLAN it should be on, things like that. Some information that Ironic needs to provision it, and here what image we want to use. So this is a YAML alias, and that provides us information about where to get that image that it should deploy on that. And the same thing for the agents. So that's how you specify a cluster. And so now we can derive a whole bunch of information from that. So if we have five masters, we know the quorum size needs to be three. If you got, um, and we can also tell all the agents, these, uh, we can tell all these agents, these are the masters that you need to talk to to uh, get your information from, that you need to enroll with, things like that. And we can tell our master nodes, or our master clusters like Suki on there, these are the nodes that you need to form a quorum with. So all that information gets automatically derived. You don't have to duplicate the information, you just specify the high level constructs, um, and then you can get like, the information on that. So this is a cluster level abstraction, a cluster way to reason about things. And it prevents us from making silly mistakes like finding a seven node cluster and setting the quorum incorrectly. Things like that. It's just the rules are encoded, you know what the rules are, so the machine, um, so code should enforce them and take care of them for us. 
X community to run that video. So now I'm going to show you simulating a change. So what I'm going to do is, for Able, I'm going to change the image. So I've got another master image, and I'm going to tell that Able should use that other master image. I'm going to uh, commit that change. So I've added the master image, and put it to use it, and we'll push it to our source control server. And then erase the PR, so you can see the PR, we've made the change, add a new image, mask able use it. And in the background, the CI CD process runs and it tells us what the change is. So it's going to say we're going to update the green cluster. And for the green cluster, on the left hand side is the old cluster, on the right hand side is the new cluster. And it tells us what the diff is. So it's going to tell us here we're making a change uh, to those nodes. And so nothing else changed. And now it's going to, can you pause here please? And uh, now it's going to simulate the change it's going to run to. So the first thing is it's going to, um, going to blow away Able and reprovision it. So I'm going to delete all its existing um, access to the cluster um, and recreate it. So that way it just enforces us to keep our secrets short-lived. Um, so if for some reason Able's um, credentials were compromised, well now here's a new credential. So every time we redeploy something, we automatically reissue credentials. Um, and then we re it. You can press play. Uh, then we do like we delete the server, um, we upload the image to the plans, which is the OpenStack image store, and we rebuild it again. And when we rebuild it, there's a whole bunch of configuration files for cloud config files we put down that have been derived um, as part of uh, the cluster definition. So you might not have seen the information in the uh, cluster yarns file, but we can automatically derive that information. Cool. Uh, and this is our cluster deployment. Can you press play again, please? So now we're standing at the three node cluster of a master and agents. Um, so, sorry. Yep. <coughs> um, so it's a uh, we're standing at three node cluster. Again, we have the editor because it takes about 10, ten minutes to stand up each node. Um, on the left hand side, we've got an IPMI console of one of the servers, the last one called Fly. And we're setting up the um, three servers, Kart, and Murex, and Fly. So now we're doing building of Fly, so we start seeing some activity. So the first step is um, that we'll use the Ironic agent to um, fix the boot into that. And the Ironic agent then copies down our OS image and deploys it. So that's what's happening here right now. And once that's done, it will do um, boot into that new OS image. So now we're rebooting into the new OS image. That's done. So now we should have a three node cluster. So you go to uh, resource, uh, reload, make sure it's up running. So apply, resource master, and we've got a three node cluster. Um, Murex, apply, and Carton. And so that was the provisional cluster. So things that work well for us. Um, updating the pull request with the actual simulated changes gives us the confidence that the changes we want to make are actually the right changes. It allows us to um, be able to see the impact. Um, and it allows us to go back if something actually went wrong, debug it, figure out why it went wrong, what was the wrong change. Um, and just when you're doing things at a cluster level that could have potentially very, um, very high impact. And the ability to actually spot, see, spot out the, all the changes, not to have to mentally do them and screw it up, but just to see what the system would do to do all that, um, is really useful. And if there's something broken where we go back to the system and reconfigured, and then we know that it's always going to do correctly. Having a cluster level abstraction, really helpful for us as well. So again, we don't, um, making a change in the machine has a large impact, so let's reason about it at the higher level impact. Let's reason about it at the cluster level, and automatically derive the required changes. Um, using one tool to manage all our changes, so you might use there's a whole bunch of probably specialized tools that exist, things like storing infrastructure information. We chose not to use that. We chose to try and do as much as we can inside source control because first we want to do everything as code, or use the principle as code, and secondly, it's, um, we only have to worry about maintaining and being familiar with one tool, um, so we've got two tools in this case, a source control and a CI CD pipeline. So both from our image building to our cluster provisioning, to building software, everything is just managed through a, a pull request flow and it's managed through a CI CD flow. So it's one tool you need to run, um, or two tools you need to run, 
and there's only two tools which you're familiar with, and so you can now invest heavily invest into building tooling around that and make them better and make them a big use case. I think that's a bit of a nice win for us to get that standardization familiarity. Um, and the last one, it's a bit left field, in particular for this kind of conference, but the tool uh, Mission Planner that we're doing to orchestrate in the clusters actually uses a concept for functional programming called an um, interpreter pattern. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to write domain specific languages for each of its functions. We have a domain specific language for doing board operations. We've got a completely independent domain specific language for um, talking to ironic. And you can easily write more domain specific languages to talk to everything else. And the nice thing of that is they're completely independent, completely abstract, and they have um, for each language we have several interpreters. So we've got an interpreter that actually does the change and actually executes it. And we've got another interpreter that simulates it, which we use for both the testing and to give that simulation output that we've shown you. Um, so it's easy to write those, and when you actually want to combine all of those, it's trivy as well. There's a constant cost to integrating one more tool into this. You don't have to worry about keeping all the tools, uh, uh, about the complexity of managing all these tools. You just worry about the complexity of managing each tool individually. And then you just pull it all together and you have a cluster level language that's just the addition of all those individual languages. And you have a cluster level driver that can make the change, that's all the addition of all the individual drivers. And so that's a really powerful tool. It makes it so much easier for us to reason about the complexity um, of doing this kind of thing. So, as I said, there's a lot of tooling to be built. Um, we have to integrate into a lot of other tools. So having this kind of nicer approach to uh, managing each of those tools individually but still being able to compose all of them makes it easier to do this. Uh, the other big problem that we have is, um, or other big pain point is deployment cycles. So now in order to make a change, it takes about 10 minutes on an individual machine. So with Puppet or Chef, you can probably roll out your changes um, quite quickly, you might have some changes that have no impact on the running system. Um, so you could do that in seconds, two minutes. Um, instead, we have to do, um, we have to run like reproduction and reproduction machines. So it takes a bit longer, but it's a deterministic time longer. But it gets a bit worse is you want to make those changes while the system is still online. So you can't just go and reboot all your machines um, and then just say, well, we're going to have a 10 minute shortage and everything's going to come back up okay and just deal with it. So you have to figure out a way to do that um, in an online fashion. So that's where we currently are in our development cycle. And so you need to consider things like we're running Hadoop. Hadoop picks three copies of the data. So what we said is we want to be able to take up at any point in time one copy of the data, uh, so one machine, and still ensure that there's still two copies of the data left in the system. So it can keep running, and so we can still endure one more failure before we start having data loss. So the kind of work that we have to do is we need to integrate into our workloads like Hadoop and go and talk to Hadoop and say, give me all the nodes that I can um, remove while still keeping two copies of each piece of data. And I'll reroute them, I'll reprovision them, and I come back to you and ask you, did all those nodes come back up? Give me the next set of nodes that I can reprovision while still keeping two copies of data. So that's the kind of integration we need to do. Um, and that involves also thinking about things like um, placement of data, and all that sort of stuff. So you might think that's a lot of effort to, it's a lot of effort you pay for simple changes, but as soon as you want to make complex changes, this is the kind of thing you want to have to do. And this is the kind of thing you need to think about, you need to have answers for that. And so we're kind of forcing ourselves to treat each change the same. And we're forcing ourselves to actually address this problem head on and to be able to make it work. And if you can make it work, there's a whole bunch of benefits we get from that. Um, one of the benefits I haven't mentioned yet is uh, we can do things like read-only file system or partially read-only file system and partially non-executable. So from a security perspective, this just avoids a whole bunch of parting that would otherwise need to do. It makes it so much harder for an adversary to persist on our file system and just gives us a huge security limit for free, pretty much. So there's still more work we need to do to leverage that, but we've started work on that and it's actually looking pretty so that's what we're doing, that's kind of what we're up to. Are there any questions? Any questions? Cool. That's it then, thank you guys.